How is your marriage relationship compared to a biblical and gospel-centered marriage? And if you're in a dating or courting season in life, then how is your relationship compared to a God-honoring relationship? Let me ask you another question. How many things would you change in your marriage? How many things would you change in your courting relationship? Did you know that it takes extraordinary courage and effort to change how you do relationships? I'm saying that because it's not easy to reset boundaries. It's not easy to communicate better. It's not easy to flee sexual immorality or to confess failures. And even though we put ourselves in tough situations, the reality is that you will never regret making the right changes. For me, it was the cost of the sinful pleasure that kept me from changing sooner. The irony is that the real cost is, if you keep pursuing the wrong relationship, then you'll pay dearly. Then you will really get acquainted to the real cost. But see, the devil piled up in my mind every conceivable reason not to do what I knew I had to do, encouraging me to make excuses, to put off decisions, to avoid Christ and indulge in sin. So I'm praying that the Holy Spirit through the next couple of things that I want to share with you will give you courage to do what you've been afraid to do for weeks, for months, maybe even for years. And if you're married, maybe it's to lay down your excuses or to take up your cross. And if you're in the dating courting season of life, to start dating differently in a way that says something stunning about your God. And the first thing is, above all else, I will look for Jesus. This will radically change how you do your marriage and your relationships. If you resolve to change nothing else about your patterns in relationships, resolve to make Jesus the most important thing in your marriage. Let me give us a verse that would rock our world if we were to take it to heart. Philippians 1.21 To me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If to live is Christ, then to marry is Christ. Then to date or court is Christ. Then to be married is Christ. And what do I mean by that? Simply put, Jesus is our reason for living and working and growing and learning and dating and marrying. Above every other priority in marrying or being married, look for Jesus. Now, it may sound simple and easy, but Satan wages an all-out war on our hearts and minds to keep us from him to keep us away from spending quality and focused time with Jesus. I mean, this is really hard. I feel like nothing could be harder. It is emotionally impossible, I think, to put Christ before our desires for intimacy and marriage unless we have the Spirit of God to help us. So, I guess, to be practical, what I'm saying is this, before you entrust your heart to someone else, resolve to love Jesus with all your heart. Before you try to love your wife and husband, resolve to love Jesus with all of your soul first. Before you sacrifice and pursue your wife, pursue Jesus with all of your strength. Resolve and pursue to love Jesus more than love, more than sex, more than your wife, more than your marriage. And your family and marriage will benefit from that. The second thing is, I will grow where I have failed before. One reason we fail in the same ways year after year is that we fail to admit and address our failures. 
If you have a sexual past or a trail of mistakes behind you, you need to know there's nowhere safer to deal with your failures than in Christ. And there are always people who will try to disqualify you from God's love. But Christ came and died precisely for the things you are most ashamed of. Check out what Apostle Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display His perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in Him for eternal life. I want to remind us, friends, that guilt and shame, these things, qualify us for His love. God wants to put His patience and mercy on display for the world by showering you with mercy and being patient with you. That's exactly what these verses are saying. He wants you to step forward like Paul to experience what Jesus died to give you. But the process begins by boldly bringing our failures at the foot of the cross, yes. But we can't just keep on sinning, thinking, oh well, He loves us. So here's what happens if we do this, if we come to Him and confess our brokenness and our sinfulness at the cross. He promises He will make us someone new, someone different than what we were before, someone people love being around because of your patience, because of your love, because of your gentleness, because of your desire to speak truth now and your desire to pursue in love. This we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Those who truly want to change where they have fallen before pursue with all of their heart accountability in the specific areas where they have failed. They seek out counsel. They embrace hard questions and humble themselves in listening to good teaching and even correction. That's why you need to get plugged in a gospel-centered church. So again, the point is this. Resolve to grow where you have failed in relationships. And the first step is to bring your specific failures to your perfectly patient and gracious Savior. And then to pursue specific steps with God's help to overcome temptation and cultivate godliness.